Well, hello, Scrappers. Mike here. Welcome back to my channel. And this is episode, what are we up to, four? Of me working on my homemade capelling oven. All right, time to get back to work on this because it is almost ready for prime time. In the last video, I got the uh, the metal frame around it and hung the door on it. And, uh, yeah, it's almost ready to go. I just got to mount the electronics on it for temperature regulation, and it should be good to go. Now that video came out recently of part three of this where I did all that work and my buddy Jim commented that I should put a second catch on here and I think he's right uh, because this door is pretty heavy and the cheap hinges I used I think are going to sag over time so when it's not in use if I close it with both latches I think that'll prevent it from sagging so I will probably add another latch to this at some point but I need to start working on the electronics to get this to a point where it's actually usable. Okay, so I've got the temperature controller here. Got the, um, got the solid state relay mounted on its big aluminum heat sink here. And it also came with um, this thermocouple, which is only good up to 600 C. So I'm not going to use this. You know, I have kilns, which is where a lot of this brick came from that I built this thing from. These are old kiln bricks. So I'm going to use one of the same type of thermal couples I use in my kilns. I'm going to use one of these. And what I think I'll do is I think I'll drill a hole in the top and then pass this down into the inside. And it could just sit there. It'll plug the hole um, and uh, should give me a good re reading on the temperature. So I'm going to use that instead of this. Now I struggled for a while um, with how to uh, mount all this stuff on here. Now the outside of this is going to get warm and this is all plastic. This needs to be kept cool. Uh, we're only going to be stressing the um, solid state relay to about a quarter of its rated amperage but still it, it, it may get warm. It's going to need to be cooled. So I don't really want to mount it to this hot frame here. So I struggled for a little while with how to do this. I know a lot of the uh, commercial units have all the electronics mounted underneath. I didn't really want to go that route. I wanted this thing to sit lower so it would be a little bit more stable at having the weight jacked up six or eight inches in the air. So um, what I'm going to do, what I came up with, is this. I'm going to mount the electronics in an external box. And this is not going to be connected to this. This will be sitting off to the side. And what I'll do is I will put an electrical outlet on the back of it and I will plug the heating elements for this into that. And this will control it. I will plug the uh, output of the uh, thermocouple into it. And this will control the heat. It'll throttle the heating element to get it to the temperature I want. And this will keep everything neat. It'll keep it away from the heat. I think this root box is just big enough. I can mount the root. It's got a it's got a mounting plate in the bottom of it here, a steel mounting plate. So I could drill some holes and mount this relay in here. Um, I could uh, get a square hole in the front here, in the top. I get a square hole in the top here and mount this in it. Um, I can have an on-off switch up here. Uh, maybe a socket for the uh, thermocouple to plug into, a tight K socket. And, uh, yeah, I think that'll work good. Now, as I said, this relay, even though we're not stressing it too much, it might get warm inside this closed box. So, uh, dissipating some heat as it operates. So, I'm also thinking I could mount a fan in here. Um, cut a hole in this side. And then cut a hole in this side and have airflow through the box. And uh, I think that'll work good. And this box can become a multitasker then. I can use it to control other heating elements besides just this one. I could use it to control small kilns, small ovens, whatever I need. You know, it could come in handy for that. So this will become a multitasker. I can plug just about anything into it and uh, have it control it. So, uh, yeah, that's what I came up with. So I need to start figuring out how to mount all this stuff in here. I think I can just... Uh, drill a couple holes in this mounting plate down here and mount the relay in there. Uh, I'm going to have to cut some holes in the side of the box to get airflow for the fan. And I'm going to have to uh, cut a square hole 
in the lid here for this and I'm going to need a power switch and a socket for this and I need an outlet on the back or somewhere to plug this into so that uh, we can run the heating element. So let me get to designing where I'm going to put all this stuff you know marking it out and then get to cutting and uh, see if we can get this knocked out in this video and get this thing up and running and uh, maybe actually compel something before the end of the video. Wouldn't that be great? Okay, let me get to work. Before I get started, let me um, address another comment or question that was made in part three video. Uh, people want to know why there's a peephole here. Uh, what's it for? Is it for me to blow oxygen in? Is it for letting air in? Well, I'm going to use it for letting air in. Uh, right now it's plugged with ceramic fiber. Let me open the door so you can see that. It is plugged with ceramic fiber. Well, I don't even know if you can see that. It's up in there. It's all plugged with fiber. Okay. I did make a hole in the fiber gasket so that if I want to unplug that hole, air can get in to uh, oxidize lead or bismuth, whatever I'm using. But what is the actual purpose of this hole? Since these are kiln bricks that I built this thing out of, um, a lot of kilns, especially older ones, have a series of peepholes built into them. And they're so potters can look inside and see if their cones have melted. Potters use um, cones that melt, little ceramic cones that melt at different temperatures to gauge the temperature inside their kiln. And they'll put a line of cones that melt at different temperatures inside the kiln and then from time to time they'll pull out a plug and look through the peephole and see which cones have melted and which haven't and they'll get an idea of what temperature their kiln is running at. Well, things have gone up, have, things have moved on a lot in the last, you know, thousand years or so. So now we have digital temperature controllers and thermocouples and that's what I'm going to use to control this thing. Um, the thermal couple will measure the internal temperature and the digital controller will throttle the, uh, the heating element to maintain the temperature I want. We don't have to look at cones melting to see what temperature we're at. Um, but that's what the peephole is for originally and I'm just going to use it um, as a way to get extra oxygen in there if I need it or I could just crack the door open a little bit and let oxygen in and let the fumes out. So that's the answer to that burning question. Might as well get that out of the way. Now let's get to work on this. So it's time to put on my designer hat and figure out how I'm going to do this exactly. So this has got to go in here. So it looks like roughly in the center of the lid is where this is going to have to be mounted so that there's space for everything. In fact I might mount it a little towards the front of the box here to make room because I'm going to need to put some sort of electrical outlet in the back to plug the uh, the furnace into so I may move this forward of the center some I'm calling this way forward so but yeah it looks like in the middle is going to work so let me find the rough middle of this thing this should just be good enough as a friend of mine would say we're not building a space shuttle here. Close enough should be good enough. So, uh, ah, I miss that guy. I haven't seen him in a lot of years. So, that would be roughly center, but I'm going to move it down this way some to make room in the back over here for an electrical outlet. So, Okay, so I need to cut that out so that this can drop in. So like I'm going to need to cut it out a little oversized. Cut on the outside of the lines by the looks of it. And I may have to file it a little bit. But hey, undersized is better than oversized. And then this will lock it in place from the back once it's in. Okay. And there needs to be like a power switch for this. So let's see, yeah, you can put a power switch just about anywhere. There's going to be plenty of room for that, I'm thinking. And I'm going to need to put probably a socket to plug the thermocouple into. Let me 
may need to move this forward a little bit just because there's a there's a ledge back there. I'll put that in roughly over here. I think that'll work. Yeah. And then a power switch. Uh, we'll just put it in roughly about here, I guess. A nice uh, power switch for on and off. And then I need to dig up some sort of outlet for in the back. Let me go dig through my junk boxes and see what I've got that I can mount on the back that I can plug the furnace into. Alright, so I rooted around in my junk box. Couldn't find any kind of workable electric outlet to put in the back of this. So here's what I came up with. I went down to Home Depot just looking for like a single outlet to put in there and I found this and I thought well that'll kill two birds with one stone. I can mount that back in here and I won't have to put uh, I won't have to locate a 15 amp toggle switch to put in here because well there's a 15 amp switch right there. So that could be the on off switch as well as the plug for the furnace. So I just need to uh, put some holes in the back of this. I can mount that in there and there should be room for everything. This of course isn't going to be in here. Get this out of the way. But yeah, everything should fit just fine. So I need to start uh, making some holes in this box and mounting stuff. And then wiring it all up. And then uh, maybe we can get to Capelli. Okay, let me get started cutting holes in this thing. I am wearing a dust mask and eye protection. So I use my Dremel. I'm going to cut, cut out a square here for the controller. Yeah, wear a dust mask when you do this. You don't want to breathe that fiberglass dust, that's for sure. And just as I figured, I made it a little bit small, but hey, that's made better than making it too big. So I can probably just get a file or a rasp and uh, work the sides out a little bit bigger so that'll drop in. So let me go find one. Oh, it almost fits. It goes in side to side, but not quite front to back. Probably another 32nd of an inch needs to come out. But uh, hey, that's fine. This file is cutting through the fiberglass really quick. It'll make sure it works at that last 32nd of an inch here.
Oh yeah, look at that. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Okay. Excellent. Oh, I gotta clean all the dust out of the inside of the box. But hey, I'm not dr done drilling holes in it yet, so I'll do that when I'm uh, when I'm done. Let me see if I can uh, get this uh, outlet and switch mounted back here next. That'll be my next project. So I'm thinking for this switch outlet combo, if I drill two circular holes the right distance apart, those are going to sit right in there nice. And this looks like the right diameter hole saw. So I just need to mark out the back where I want to drill and drill these two holes. And hopefully this will sit right in there perfectly. We'll see if I can do it. Okay, so I want this thing to sit in here right about here. Let me mark the center line here. Oops, I keep bumping it. The center line here. Draw a line across. So, let's find the middle of this thing. Here and it look and it looks like these are about an inch and a half on center. These circles that these would fit in. So inch and a half on center. So if I drill two holes centered up like that, that should do it. We'll see how close I am. So I'm thinking if my drill bit doesn't walk too much, this should work pretty well. Well, there's one. how I did. Look at that! Look at that! Sometimes I even amaze myself. Alright, I'm going to have to drill some holes for the mounting ears. There's not enough meat left in the center for the central hole. So, I'll hold it on with the, uh, with the mounting ears out here. Alright, cool. This thing's coming together. Pretty happy with that. Well, I could just stick this in this way and mark where I need to drill the holes for mounting it. Easy peasy. I'll just drill them out and bolt that in with some screws. Although, I may leave it out for now until after I have it wired. Might be easier to wire with it out of the box. Yeah, I won't be able to get to the I won't be able to get to the screws on the bottom when it's mounted. So I'll wire this up then mount it in the box. So I will drill the holes when I get a chance. So they'll be ready to go and find some mounting screws. Well I drilled a couple of mounting holes for the fan based on where it sits inside the box. And then I drilled out the rivets that held the uh, fan guard in place. I'm gonna have to modify it because there's this thing right here but I can do that with just some wire cutters. But this will give me an idea of where I need to center the hole to drill out for the fan. Right about there. Okay. So let me get my hole saw in, my big hole saw in. We'll drill that out. And then I will drill a hole on the other side as a vent hole. And I will need another fan guard. So we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. This hole saw is actually a little undersized, but I think we'll get it plenty of airflow through here. I'm not too worried about it. There we 
we go. Pretty good. A little bit ragged on the inside. On the inside where it doesn't show. <laughs> Let's see. Airflow direction. Airflow that away. Yep. That's going to work. The mounting holes line up. All right. So, yep. Okay. Cool. So, I'll just need to drill another hole in this side. And then we can have cross ventilation. I'll mount the relay over here. It can be in the cool air coming in. Perfect. I guess it's going to work great. So, let me get that other hole drilled and then move on to something else. All right. There's the second hole. You can see right through it now. And um, I had some fan shrouds that I printed, 3D printed, a while back for another project. And I printed several extras thinking that they would come in handy and just threw them in my junk box. So, yep, that can go over the inlet. And the one that came with the fan can go over the outlet. Alright, I think that'll work. I think all I have left to do is cut out... Um, where I want to put the uh, connector for the thermal couple. So uh, I need to find a Type K connector, cut out a hole for it, and then epoxy it in place. So let me find a connector, and then I'll cut the hole. All right, so I think the last hole I need to drill in this thing is for the uh, thermal couple connector, and I found a Type K connector here. And yeah, this is... Uh, what I sketched out just by a, a memory is not too bad, but uh, we'll get it just right Need to be a little fatter. All right, so let me get the, uh, the Dremel out again, and I will put in this, this hole, and uh, we'll get that mounted too. Yep, there we go. That'll work. All right, I'll just have to epoxy that in. And hey, presto, we got ourselves a uh, connector for the thermocouple. Okay, all the holes I need are drilled in the box now. It's just a matter of mounting all this stuff in here and wiring it all together. So let me get started on that and uh, see how it goes. I think I'm going to start with mounting the relay over here and the fan, mindful of the airflow direction, over here. I don't think they're going to be too much in the way of other stuff, so I can probably mount them. Um, I can mount, well mounting this is going to be dead easy. This just drops right in this hole like this and this keeper goes on like that and there that's mounted well that was easy so let me get the fan and the uh, relay screwed in and then I'll work on some other stuff I think well I have drilled holes for the fan and I have some screws here um, I think for the relay what I'll do is I will go with self drilling screws into this steel plate the steel mounting plate in the bottom of the box here to hold it in place I think that's what I'll do. Okay.
Okay, yeah, these self-drilling screws are going to mount this nice. Although now I am filling the inside of the box with um, metal shards as the screws go in. So I'll have to clean those out so I don't wind up with a short circuit. But there's the relay mounted. Let's see if I can get those metal shards out of there. All right. Next for the fan, like so. Just gonna hold that in with a couple of screws, and uh, they'll go through and hold on the guard on the outside. That's my plan. Well, it's starting to look like something, if I do say so myself. Got the the 3D printed fan guard on that side. Got the original fan guard over here. Controller is mounted. Relays mounted, fans mounted. Um, I think I said earlier that I'm going to wait to mount this until after I have wires on it and everything wired up because it's going to be very difficult to get to the screws on the bottom otherwise. So I'll put that in later. Um, right now I still need to glue this in, but I need to put wires on it first because I won't be able to get wires on it first. I won't be able to get wires on it after I glue this in. Uh, so I'm gonna got a little piece of thermal couple wire here. I'll take this apart. I need to go get my jeweler screwdrivers to get this apart. And um, one thing you need to remember when you're working with thermal couple wire, there's a plus and a minus side on these, and the red side is always negative with thermal couple wire. Yeah, that'll screw you up if you don't know that. Red is negative with thermal couple wire. So hook the red side up to the mi uh, the minus side of the connector and whatever other color you got, depending on what type of thermal couple you're working with, up to the plus side. This is type K, so we've got red and yellow here, and red is negative again. Let me go find my jeweler screwdrivers, get this made up, I'll get it glued in, and uh, then we can start the wiring all this stuff together. We're in the home stretch now. We'll have this up and running soon. Okay, I've got my little thermocouple connector pigtail made up here. So my plan here is to just hold this in place with a little bit of hot melt glue. Because this will, this will solidify really quickly. Just a little bit. Hold it where I want it until it hardens up. And then I'll come back and I will use some epoxy on the other side to hold it in place permanently so I don't trust hot melt glue for structural stuff but epoxy I think will work just fine okay so that's setting up good and I'll have to mix up some either epoxy or JB weld or something and I'll come at it from the other side around here to hold it in place all right I'm gonna wait for a warmer day to use the epoxy on that because it is really cold today and that epoxy will take forever to set up in this weather so I guess it's time to just start wiring up everything it's a fairly simple circuit um, I'll draw a schematic and give you a look at it but wiring this up shouldn't take too long hey I was an electronic engineer I could practically do this with my eyes closed okay it shouldn't be too difficult for you either. All right, like I said, it's a fairly simple schematic. There's there's not a lot to this thing. Um, basically, it's just built around this PID temperature control unit. All of the complicated stuff is inside of it, and you've just got a few connections that you have to make to it. All right, um, we need a thermocouple input, and I got a socket on that so I can disconnect it and reconnect it. You don't have to have a socket if you don't want to. I find that's more convenient. Okay, the rest of this stuff is inside the box. Uh, we've got the solid state relay which is going to turn the power on and off to the heating elements in the oven. Alright, and uh, you're going to have a plus and a minus coming out of your PID temperature control unit going to the solid state relay. Um, you don't have to use the same control unit I'm using. You don't have to use the same solid state relay I'm using. 
Um, they're often sold as um, a pair and you know the ones I bought may not be available tomorrow or next week uh, but something else might be. But uh, just basically follow um, the directions or you know whatever writing is on your units alright um, so I didn't I didn't put um, screw numbers on here or anything because your unit might be different than mine but it's going to have an AC neutral input and AC hot input to power it it's going to have a solid state relay plus solid state relay minus outputs and it's going to have a thermocouple plus and thermocouple minus inputs so they're all going to have that um, we've got um, power coming in from the wall plug uh, we're going to have an on off switch we're going to have a fuse that's kind of a late addition to the uh, the project but it's always a good idea to have a fuse and we are going to have um, a wall socket so that we can plug the oven into it and uh, this is just going to measure the temperature in the oven and if it's below the set point in the control unit it's going to turn on the solid state relay which will send power out to the oven through the wall socket and if your temperature in the oven gets up to the set point well it's going to turn off the solid state relay and no more power will be going to the oven and that's the way it's going to throttle the uh, heating elements in the oven and it could do this fairly quickly uh, you you may see that it's going on and off fairly quickly to try and keep the temperature where it needs to be okay so like I said, fairly simple, not much to it, easy to wire up. Okay, one wiring issue we need to deal with is this switch. Now the way this is set up, this is your hot line in, okay? And this would be your neutral right here. And of course you got a ground pop pin over here, or a ground screw over here. Now, the way this works is you don't even actually have to connect anything to either of these, okay? because there's a bridge right there between them. So when this switch is on, power would come from your hot line through here across this bridge to the hot side of your outlet. And of course you got your neutral line going to the neutral side and you got your ground line going to your ground lug. So, but we don't want this outlet to be live when the switch comes on. We want this outlet to be live when the controller controller over here tells it to be live through the uh, solid state relay here. So we're going to need to make some modifications. First thing we need to do, we need to break this bridge off. And it's designed to be broken off. If you bend it a few times, metal fatigue will break it off. In theory, this one's tough. There it goes. Okay, so we got it. So now, the outlet is completely independent from the switch. So the way this is going to work now is your hot line's coming in here. It's going out here. It's going to go to power both your controller and the solid state relay. And then the output from the solid state relay is going to be going into here. And that's where you'll get your, uh, your power for your switch. Or for, that's where you'll get your power for your outlet from rather than having it come directly from the switch. I hope that's somewhat understandable. We'll take another look at the diagram. Now here's the change we need to make to the, the, the switch plug combo, okay? Basically as it comes out of the box, the switch is wired directly over here to this plug. Alright? We don't want that. So we've got to break off that little tab so that the power doesn't go directly to the plug. We want the power to come down here to the solid state relay and to the uh, PID temperature control unit but we don't want it to go straight to the plug. Uh, we want the power to go through the solid state relay before it gets to the plug so that's why we have to break that little tab off. Alright the wiring has begun. <laughs> I have my little thermocouple pigtail wired into the connectors on the back of the controller. Now I just gotta wire everything else. Okay I forgot something. Time to fess up here. And some of you may have already noticed the omission. I forgot to drill a hole for where the power cord will go in. Yes, so I need to do that. And speaking of power cords, we're using a fairly short and heavy-duty power cord because this thing's going to be drawing a fair amount of current. 
okay? So I'm going to keep the, the cord short and um, heavy gauge. And speaking of current, I have decided to make a last minute change in the design here. I'm going to add a fuse to this rather than relying on uh, the circuit breaker to blow uh, if there's a problem because in my workshop I have a variety of different outlets wired for different amperages. I have 15 amp outlets, I have 20 amp outlets, I have 50 amp outlets. Although I would have to make an adapter to plug this in the 50 amp outlet. But uh, yeah, I don't want to rely on the circuit breaker to blow because this thing's normally only going to be drawing around 12 amps in normal operation. Um, if there's a problem, if it gets up to 15 amps, I want this fuse here to blow rather than relying on the breaker to pop, okay? So I'll, I'll wire this in and put a 15 amp fuse in it. Um, if there was, if this thing was drawing 20 amps, certainly there would be some kind of problem. I wouldn't want to rely on a 20 amp breaker to blow or certainly not a 50 amp breaker. This 50 amps, this thing's drawing 50 amps, it's going to be a fireworks display, okay? So I'm going to put in this fuse holder and put a 15 amp fuse in it and if for some reason this thing gets up to 15 amps, that fuse will blow, everything will be happy. All right, we won't have any fireworks display. So let me get a hole drilled for the power cord coming in before I forget to do that again. And then we can get to seriously wiring this thing. I think I'm going to put the hole for the power cord right about here. That should work. And I didn't mention it, but I'm using 14 gauge wire. It's fairly heavy gauge wire. It should be able to handle the load. So all of the high current AC wire in here is going to be 14 gauge. Okay. There's also going to be some DC wiring, which can be very, which doesn't need to be heavy gauge at all. And uh, the fan wiring doesn't need to be heavy, and the wiring to the uh, controller doesn't need to be heavy because they're not drawing much current. But the high current stuff is all going to be 14 gauge. All right. <sighs> Get back to wiring now. Oh, and, and I don't have a uh, I don't have a grommet that's going to work for this. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put um, a couple of wire ties really tight on the inside so that the wire can't pull out then. And uh, I think that'll work okay. Again, I'm just making this out of what I got around my shop for the most part. I'm not buying a lot of stuff. All right. So, let me get back to wiring. All right. Are you ready for the big reveal? It's completely wired. There you go. So, I didn't make you watch me wire it. Saved you from watching an hour of tedious wiring and hearing the occasional curse word, but this actually went pretty smoothly. So I guess we're ready for a smoke test. <laughs> we'll see what happens when we plug this thing in. And rather than trying to run the uh, furnace with it right off, I think I'm going to find another load that's going to be a little bit more manageable and we'll be able to see whether it's on or off without waiting for the wires to start glowing. So let me find something else and we'll uh, give it the old smoke test. Alright, it's time to give this thing a test. Um, I have one of my kiln thermal couples plugged into the socket here. And I have one of my work lights back here. I'm going to plug that into the outlet in the back. And that will be our test load, okay? Okay, I'm going to plug the controller into the power. It's always a little scary when you do this the first time with something you built. No sparks, no flames. Good so far. Now here's what I propose to do. I'm going to turn this on. And it's quite a chilly day today. So the thermal couple is going to read a very low temperature. So let's see what happens. Well, okay. Ah, and look, our light came on. Our thermal couple is reading 62 Fahrenheit. I don't know if that's showing up. 62 Fahrenheit. And apparently the the set point it came up at was 100 degrees. I have not powered this up before. I have not messed with these settings. 
So it looks like the thermocouple is reading 62 degrees out here, and the set point is 100 degrees. So this is telling the heating element to come on because it's too cold, so that's why our light came on. All right, so what I have here is a propane torch. I'm gonna light the propane torch, and I'm gonna warm up the end of the thermocouple, and we'll see what happens. Look at the temperature coming up. Aha! Uh -huh. The light went out. Now it's blinking. That's to be expected with this sort of temperature controller. It measured the rapid increase in temperature and it turned off the heating element. At least it thinks it's turning off the heating element. And now it's throttling the element to try and keep the temperature where it needs to be. But of course, the, the thermocouple's cooling off again. So, yeah, so basically it's working just the way it's supposed to work. Yeah. All right. Holy cow, it works first try. <laughs> I love it when a plan comes together. All right, so I guess the only thing we really need to do, oh, here the fan running. Yeah, the fan's running. It's drawing air in and Blowing it out. Okay, so everything's working. All right, so I guess it's time to hook it up to the actual furnace and see if it's going to control the furnace the way I want it to. So let me set up for that. Okay, well, I guess it's time to see if this thing will actually control the compelling oven. So I haven't made too many changes to the compelling oven since the last video. And I'll put a link to the last video in the upper right. Um, I have put a second catch on the door, which I discussed in that last video to uh, help hold the weight of the door when it's it's just in storage because I figure that heavy door is going to sag over time. Uh, the hinges will sag. Um, I drilled a hole up top to insert the kiln thermocouple in and uh, you can just barely see the end of it sticking down inside there. Okay, not too close to any of the heating elements. You know, I really want to measure the temperature of the inside of the furnace, not the uh, not the actual radiant heat coming off of an element real close by, okay? So I have the oven plugged into the controller. It's all ready to go. I have uh, converted the controller to centigrade from Fahrenheit because the uh, temperature scale, and I'm a little confused you know, reading the instructions here, but I'm a little confused. Um, the highest the temperature reading will go is 999, which is not very hot in Fahrenheit, but is blazing hot in centigrade. So we'll see how hot we can get it. I have set the temperature controller to 800 C. And we'll see what happens. We'll see if it will actually get the oven that hot. Okay, so let me close the door. Come over here and turn on the switch. And it's booting up. And it says it's 16C out here right now. It's a cool day. It's set for 800. The little light is on saying that the heating element's on. And hey, look, look at this. I'll zoom in on that for you if you can't see it. The temperature's coming up already. Look at that, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44. Well, we'll just let this sit for a while and see what kind of temperature we can get this thing up to. See if we can actually get it up to 800 C. All right, that would be plenty hot enough, I think, for capelling. All right, so we'll just let this sit for a little while. Let's see, it's uh, 243. And we'll come back and we'll check it in a little while. And see what we got. Well, this is now 247. And look at the temperature. My goodness, it is coming up fast. That's coming up really fast. I wouldn't be surprised if I've got a little bit of a radiant heat effect coming off of the heating elements. But the inside of the furnace has got to be heating up pretty good, too. We'll let it go a little while longer, and then we'll crack open the furnace and see what it looks like inside. We'll see how red and glowy it is. 
Okay, it's 301 and we are at 774 degrees. Wow, this thing heats up quick. Quick. Let's take a look inside. If it's really that hot inside, I better go get my welding gloves before we take a peek inside. Okay, I reposition the camera a little bit, try and get you a better look inside. 784 degrees C. Let's see what we got here. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is hot. That's feel the burn, baby. Wow, the radiant heat coming out of there is pretty impressive. All right. I think we might have successfully built a compelling oven. Okay. So I'm thinking maybe tomorrow I'll get set up and compel something in it and see how it goes. All right. But I'm pretty happy with it. It's It seems to be working great. The furnace is working good. The controller's working good. Not bad. You know, and I got I got a fraction of the cost of an actual commercial unit in this whole home built thing. I couldn't be happier. Okay. Yeah, let me turn it off and let it start cooling down so I can move it back indoors. Because uh, it's getting kind of late in the day. And maybe tomorrow we'll set it up and we'll try capelling something. All right, guys, I think it's trying to actually try capelling something with this furnace. Okay, but first, first, we have some important business to take care of. Rick Brock, who is a great patron to this channel, earned the naming rights for this furnace by making a generous donation to this channel. It's time to unveil the name he came up with. Now, I've been pestering him for a few weeks to come up with a name for this thing. And he's, he finally got back to me and said, well, you know, I couldn't think up anything good. I polled my friends and family, and well, this is all I've got. It sounds corny. I thought, though, that the names that he came up with were fantastic, and, you know, I, I don't have a problem with corny. I like corny, okay? i got to introduce a little comedy into life, right? Um, but I think he came up with a couple of fantastic names, he said, well, if you don't like them, use something else. So, well, I can't even pick between his two best names. So it's going to kind of have a main name and a nickname. So here we go. Here's the great unveiling of the names Rick came up with. That's right. Furnace of Truth. That's very appropriate. Because that's what's, what you're looking for when you're doing a fire assay. You're looking for the truth of how much precious metal there is in your samples. Okay? And then, a.k.a. Mike's Easy Bake Oven. I love it. That got a good chuckle out of me. You know, I would bake cookies in it, probably, from time to time, if it weren't for the fact I'm going to be, you know, oxidizing a bunch of lead in it, which wouldn't be good for putting food in there. Uh, but it could be used for other things. It could be used as a bake-out furnace for mold baking and things like that, where I can bake wax or plastic out of plaster molds before using them to uh, cast metal or glass. So it could get used as a baking oven, just not for food. Okay, so I think it's time we fired this thing up and uh, actually did some compelling. So it's only been a few minutes and look at that, 562 degrees, 563, 564. It's heating up fast. I like how fast this thing heats up. Cool, I mean, we're already well above the melting point of lead. So 800, I'm thinking, should be plenty hot enough for propelling. We'll be there soon. So I've got this 26.3 gram button of lead here. And I think we will compel it first thing. Now I know from experience that the lead I'm using contains a little bit of silver. It's uh, old roofing flashing lead that I've had probably, well, it was probably my father's. It's probably been around longer than I have been around. Um, and, you know, it's not unusual for lead to be contaminated with silver. Um, most silver these days comes as a byproduct of lead and zinc mining. A lot of lead and zinc ores are heavily contaminated with uh, silver to the point where it's a major commodity. So uh, there should be some silver in this once we compel it down. But just to make sure, I actually melted this down in this little crucible right here. And I have used this crucible in the past to melt silver, and there were some tiny little beads of silver stuck in the uh, melted borax there in the crucible. 
Well, now they're in here. So we're definitely, so we definitely should get some silver out of this once we capel this down. So let's go over the capelling furnace and see if it's ready to go. Okay, this has been running for quite a while now. And the temperature bounces up close to the set point and then uh, falls back down a little bit. I think it's about as hot as it's going to get. We may be... I maybe if I set the uh, set point higher, we might get it a little hotter, but I think this is probably going to be hot enough. All right, because like 796 is where we are now, and that is uh, in Fahrenheit 4, 1464, almost 1465 degrees. So, so I think we're hot enough to do some compelling. I've got my lead button there ready to go. Got my couple tongs. Let me reposition the camera so you can see inside, and. We'll get this show on the road. Okay, I've zoomed in a little bit. Hopefully I can do this without blocking the view too badly. Let's get this lead in here. We'll see what this capel in here looks like. Oh yeah, everything in there is good and hot. Let me get the lead in it. Close the door and we'll check on it again in a minute and see if it's melted and then after that it should start oxidizing and uh, running off. Okay, it, it has literally been like 30 seconds. Let's have a look here. Oh yeah, I hope that's showing up. There's a puddle of molten lead in that cupel now. Okay, so we'll just let it do its thing. I'll leave the door cracked a little bit. I'm sure the temperature will come down some, but it should be still high enough for this to work. But with the door cracked, we'll get some oxygen in there to oxidize the lead. The lead oxide, which will be above its melting point, will soak into the bone ash cupel and expose more lead to the air, which will, the process will continue. Every time fresh lead is exposed to the air, it'll oxidize. The liquid oxide will get soaked into the bone ash cupel and eventually all the lead will be gone as lead oxide soaked into the cupel and any precious metals not easily oxidized like gold or silver will be left behind as a tiny little bead in the cupel. So we'll check on it again in a little while and see how it's going. Well I bumped up the temperature a little bit because 800 is actually a little on the cool side for compelling but I'll tell you what it was working. I took a peek inside there and I started seeing the black rind around the, uh, the molten puddle of lead the oxide is soaking into the capel. Let's take a quick look. Can you see that? Look at that. I hope you can see that. Yep. The oxide is forming and rolling off of that lead button and soaking into the capel. Got some fumes coming off, which is why I'm doing this outside and I'm standing upwind of it. But yeah, it's working. Cool. You close the door again and let it keep working. I think at the rate it's going, this will be done probably before lunch. Nice. Let's have a quick peek. Oh, there's not much left. I hope that little bitty bead's showing up. Yeah. All right. Good. Yeah, it's just a couple minutes after noon, too. I figured this would be done by noonish. So cool. All right, we appear to be done. It's been, I don't know, 15 minutes since the last segment I filmed. I've been watching the bead. It's pretty small and it's not getting any smaller. So I would say we are done. Let me get it out of there. There it is. I'll give you a close up look at it. We get the furnace shut down and we'll go take a look at it under the bench lights okay here we are up on the workbench I haven't turned the lights on so you can see that the cupel is still glowing I think we missed the blick though but uh, we turn the lights on yeah it's pretty wicked hot but uh, there's our little bead of silver that we got from the uh, from compelling that 26 grams of lead and it probably it went pretty pretty easy and trouble free. Probably would have gone a little quicker if I had used less lead because I think these are only 30 gram capacity cupels. So we're right at 
about at the at the max of what these cupels could handle. But uh, hey, it worked. It didn't take that long. Um, no problems. And uh, like I said, some of this silver was going to be present in the lead initially anyway as a contaminant. But I used that lead to wash my silver melting uh, crucible and got some of the little uh, stray beads of silver in it corralled in the lead. And now got some fairly pure silver here. I can add that to my silver jar. Okay, this went pretty nicely. Well, I think the first cupellation in the Furnace of Truth, a.k.a. Mike's Easy Bake Oven, went pretty darn well. I am so stoked that this thing is working, and I think you're going to see this in a lot of future videos. In about a month, I'm headed out west again, and I'll be coming back with a lot of ore from some old gold mines. And we'll probably be smelting some of that and doing cupellations in this oven once I get back from that trip. So, I th yeah, I think you're going to see a lot of this in the future. i gotta, I got to find a way to permanently get the, uh, the name of the oven on there. But I, I just couldn't be more pleased with how this worked. It was just about perfect, trouble-free. And uh, if you folks out there need your own compelling furnace, just, you know, hey, roll your own. It's not that hard, and it's a whole lot cheaper than buying one. If I can do it, anybody can, right? So anyway, I hope you folks found this series of videos interesting, informative, educational, whatever. Give it a like, give it a thumbs up, and subscribe to see my future videos, some of which will star the furnace of truth. Check out my second channel, Electric Geek 64 There's good stuff going on over there. If you're at all interested in electronics or retro computing, in fact, I made a, a, a separate video about building the controller over here, which hint, hint, still needs a name, and that's out on that channel, along with a lot of other neat stuff. Subscribe to see my future videos. I'll see you in the next one. Have a good one. Bye.